for being here for this uh, event that we're very proud to host. Uh, as Dr. Dinesh mentioned, I was a former student of uh, Walter Williams. I got my PhD at George Mason University. In the one of the classes I took was uh, graduate. My first class that I took in the fall of 2013 was the uh, graduate microeconomics course with Dr. Williams. And by far, it was uh, one of my favorite courses uh, for the uh, really my entire time there. And he was one of the few professors who, whenever I mentioned his name to other people, they said, wow, you're taking a class by Walter Williams? Uh, he's the closest thing we have to, some people might say this is an oxymoron, a celebrity economist. He's, he's, very, uh, he's very famous and well known. And uh, one of my favorite moments from the class was in his, uh, for his tests, he would give out stickers to those students who perform the highest. And I, I received the stickers, so I said, now I'm moving up in the, in the world getting stickers on my tests. Uh, but in all, in all seriousness, so Dr. Walter Williams is the author of numerous articles, popular commentary, and uh, in books. Uh, one of my favorite books by him is uh, uh, More Freedom Means, uh, More Government Means Less Freedom. Our founders knew this well. And in all of his works, he has stressed the importance of private property and the role of a free society uh, in relationship to government, a lot of themes that are often underplayed or misunderstood today. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Walter Williams, uh, an evening with Dr. Walter Williams. He will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions, and, uh, questions at the end. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome. And it is indeed a pleasure uh, to be in Florida because uh, in my residence in Valley Forge, it's still cold. <laughs> um, the title of my talk is The Legitimate Role of Government in a Free Society. Now, in the course of my comments, I'm going to say many things that will break with conventional wisdom, things that will sound mean-spirited, maybe, and uncaring, and politically incorrect. And to the extent that that is true, you should feel free to raise any kind of question during the question and answer period. Uh, you need not uh, show me undue courtesy because I'm your guest, raise hard questions. Do not worry about insulting me. I am uninsultable. <laughs> the only way you could possibly insult me is to suggest that I wasn't pretty good in basketball. <laughs> and that's a matter of ethnic pride that I take seriously. <laughs> One of the justifications for the growth of government particularly the federal government, far beyond what the founders of our nation uh, envisioned was to, promote, uh, was to promote fairness and justice. That might be a worthy goal, but we might also ask, what is fairness and justice? What is the legitimate role of government in a free society? Let me spend a few moments discussing what the founders saw as the role of the federal government. And to do that, let's turn to the rule book that they gave us, namely the United States Constitution. Most of what the founders saw as the legitimate role of the federal government are found in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. Allow me to briefly quote sections thereof. The Article 1, Section 8 says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. Congress also has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and among Indian tribes. Congress, they authorized Congress the power to coin money, to establish post office and post roads, to raise and support armies, 
the framers of the Constitution granted Congress these and a few additional powers and, uh, for, for other activities. Now, nowhere in the United, States, the United States Constitution do we find constitutional authority for Congress spending up to two-thirds or three-quarters of what Congress spends for now. There's no authority in the United States Constitution for business bailouts, for handouts to farmers, handouts to poor people. In other words, we have, we have significantly departed from the basic principles that the framers of the Constitution gave us. Now, through numerous successful attacks, private property and free enterprise that the framers envisioned for us are mere skeletons of their past. And Thomas Jefferson anticipated this when he said that the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to yield. The best way of looking at the process of government gaining ground and liberty yielding is to ask what has happened to taxation and spending in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way to look at taxes. Taxes represent government claims on private property. And indeed, if government were to tax private property at 100%, they would confiscate private property. Fortunately, they're not up to that percentage yet. An even better way of looking at what government is doing, what Congress is doing, is to look at what has happened to spending in our nation. Let's go back to 1902, for example. In 1902, expenditures at all levels of government totaled $1.7 billion. That year, the average taxpayer paid $60 in federal, state, and local taxes. In fact, from 1787 until 1925, the federal government was only 3% of the GDP, except during wartime. Compared to today, the federal government is close to 25% of the GDP. State and local governments spend close to three billion dollars. The average taxpayer today pays more than ten thousand dollars in federal, state, and local taxes. Now what does that mean? Well the significance of it is that as time goes by you and I own less and less of our most valuable property. Namely ourselves and the fruits of our labor. Another way of looking at this is that the average taxpayer works from January 1st until near the end of April to pay federal, state, and local taxes. Now what that means is that we're going on four months out of the year where we do not have the rights to decide how the fruits of our labor are used. Somebody else makes the decision of how the fruits of our labor will be used. Now keep in mind that the working definition of slavery is that you work all year and it is someone else that decides how the fruits of our labor are used. Now, in the economic sphere, the founders thought that relatively free markets, or what is called capitalism sometimes, was the most effective social organization for the promotion of individual freedom. Indeed, capitalism is defined as a system wherein individuals are free to pursue their own interests. 
so long as they do not violate the property rights of others. Under capitalism, there is voluntary, peaceable exchange. There are private property rights held in goods and services. Indeed, much of the original intent of the United States Constitution, as seen in the document itself, and the Federalist Papers, and other papers that, that debated the Constitution, was to bring about a climate in which this kind of social organization could occur. The great benefit of the free enterprise system is that through private ownership and control, it minimizes the capacity of one person to coerce another person. Additionally, the coercive powers of the state are minimized and restricted to the legitimate functions of government in a free society. And what are the legitimate functions of government in a free society? Well, one legitimate function is to protect you and me from international thugs violating our private property rights. So that means that one legitimate function of government is for the provision of national defense. Another legitimate function of government at some level is to protect you and me from domestic thugs violating our private property rights. So that says that there should be the, the provision of police services. Other legitimate functions of government in free society are those of enforcing constitutional order, the adjudication of disputes, the provision of certain public goods, public goods as an economist would define them. Now, in order to pay for these legitimate and constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government, each citizen is obliged to pay his share. So I'm not arguing against taxes. I'm arguing for the legitimate function of government and free society. And matter, matter of fact, when I say that government's role is to protect private property, I mean, pri I mean you and I are private property. I belong to Walter Williams, and you belong to yourself. You're private property. Now, the desire for the, for the last half century, free enterprise, and what it implies has been under unrelenting attack. Americans from all walks of life, whether they realize it or not, have demonstrated a deep and abiding contempt for private property and economic liberty. Free enterprise today is threatened not because of its failure. It's threatened somewhat ironically because of its success. That is, free enterprise or capitalism has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, such as pestilence, disease, gross hunger, and poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once, be at once unbearable and inexcusable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems have led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our prosperous nation was founded. In the name of other ideals, such as equality of income, sex and race balance, affordable housing, Medicare, orderly markets, consumer protection, energy conservation, just name a few. We have abandoned many personal liberties. As a result of widespread control by government, 
in an effort to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we are increasingly being subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are but secondary and tertiary matters. They're treated as dirt in our country. Now you might say, well, what's this guy talking about? Well, imagine I write a letter to the United States Congress. I tell them, my name is Walter Williams. I am fully capable of taking care of my retirement needs. If I don't, let me go begging or die on the streets, but stop taking money out of my paycheck for Social Security. How do you think I'd be greeted? Be greeted with content. Here are some people telling you and me how much we should set aside out of week, each week's pay for retirement. How would you like it if they said how much you set aside for food, for housing, for education, for entertainment? You view it as tyranny. And so to, for the government to take that position, tell emancipated adults how much we should set aside for retirement, it's just tyranny. Now, the ultimate end of widespread control by government is totalitarianism. <coughs> now, I am not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty, or are we headed towards more government control over our lives? It have to be the latter. More government control over our lives. Now, the ultimate end to this is totalitarianism, <laughs> which is nothing more than a re reduced form of servitude. Now, remember, if you take tiny steps towards any goal, it's just a matter of when you reach the goal. Or as David Hume, the very famous philosopher, said, he said, it is seldom that liberty is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. Or maybe a better way of explaining this process is by my late friend Leonard Reed, the founder of the of the uh, Foundation for Economic Education, the first free market think tank in the United States. Leonard Reed said, if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had to know how to cook a frog. Now Leonard Reed said, you cannot cook a frog by putting on a pot of boiling water and then throwing the frog, the frog in the water. Because the frog's reflexes are so quick that as soon as his feet touch the boiling water, he would hop away and be free. Leonard Reed said, the way to cook a frog is to put it on a pot of cold water. Put the frog in the water and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. That's the same thing with Americans. If anybody came over here talking about taking away all of our freedoms, all at once, we would righteously rebel. But then, they can talk about <coughs> taking away our freedoms bit by bit. Now, the primary justification for the attack on private property and economic freedom and privacy can be found in people's desire for government to do good. We say that government should care for the poor. Government should help the disadvantaged. Government should help the elderly, failing businesses, college students, and other deserving segments of our society. Well, it's nice to say that, but we have to recognize that government has no resources of its very own. 
What I mean by that, those programs coming out of Washington or out of Tallahassee, they don't represent congressmen and legislators reaching in their own pockets and sending out the money. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus giving the money. Now, once you recognize that government has no resources resource of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Uh, and if you think I'm being too loose with the terminology, intimidation, threats, and coercion, you have April 15th to check me out on this. <laughs> you can tell me each of the Congress <coughs> that you're willing to pay for the constitutionally mandated federal functions of the federal government, but you're not sending any money to farmers, bailing up uh, big businesses, or subsidies, or money to poor people. You will see all the intimidation, threats, and coercion that you want to see just for writing it down. Now, we Americans, we support government doing things that if the private citizen did the identical thing, we would roundly condemn him as an ordinary, low-down, despicable thief. For example, suppose I saw an elderly lady in the dead of winter in New York City, sleeping on a grate. She's hungry, she needs some medical attention, and she needs shelter. So as I walked up to Professor Dinez, and I say, or I point a gun at him, I say, give me your $200. Then having gotten this $200, I go down and buy the lady some medical attention, some food, and shelter. Would you find me guilty of a crime? Yes. I'd be guilty of theft, wouldn't I? Yes. Most Americans would agree with me. But here's the problem. Now, we support Congress doing the identical thing. That is, for example, the agents of the United States Congress named the IRS, they say, Williams, do you know that $200 you made last week that you planned to buy a nice bottle of Chateau uh, 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 Brion wine? Chateau Lafitte wine? You will not do that with the money. You'll give it to us. And we will go downtown and help a lady out. Is there any distinction between those two acts? None whatsoever. Both acts involve taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. If you press me for a distinction, I can only find one. And that distinction ought to be trivial, trivial to moral people. That is, the first act where I walked up to Professor Denez and took his $200, that is illegal theft and I go to jail. The second act, where the IRS came up and took my $200, that is legal theft. Both acts are theft. Both acts involve take, forcibly taking the property of one person and giving it to another. Now many people say, well, Williams, you know, uh, it's legal. But for moral people, we cannot allow legality alone to be our guide. Because there are many things in this world that are or were legal, but clearly immoral. Slavery was legal in our country, wasn't it? Did that make it moral? The Nazi purges, the extermination of Jews, that was legal. Was it moral? The Stalinist and Maoist purges in Russia and China in the Soviet Union and China, they were legal, but were they moral? 
we Americans have to ask the moral question. Can we make a moral case for taking what belongs to one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong? Now, I know I don't look like it, but in my 83 years of life, I have not come up with a moral explanation. Um, now, in a free society, we want most, if not all, of our relationships to be voluntary. And we want to minimize involuntary exchange. You know, sometimes people get hung up between voluntary and involuntary. For voluntary, I like to use the example of seduction. I love seduction. <laughs> um, let me explain, because some of you, right? <laughs> some of you people are young enough for your hormones to be in uproar. <laughs> What's the essence of seduction? Seduction is when we proposition our fellow man in the following fashion. We say, if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. And for those of you who remember your game statistics, we call that a positive sum game where both parties benefit in their own estimation. Let me give you an example of seduction. It's all around us. I walk into my grocer with $3 in my hand, and I proposition him. I say, if you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk. I'll make you feel good, give you $3. He's better off because he paid $3 more than the milk. And I'm better off because I value them up more than $3. We're both better off. That's what voluntary exchange or seduction produces. Now, on the other hand, rape is something entirely different. The essence of rape is when we proposition our fellow man in the following fashion. We say to him, if you don't make me feel good, I'm going to make you feel bad. And an example of that would be where I walked into the grocer with a gun in my hand. And I say, if you don't make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'm going to make you feel bad, blow your brains out. Clearly, I'm better off, but the, gross, but the grocer is worse off. And for, again, for those who remember your game theory, then we call that a zero-sum game. That is a zero-sum game. Uh, the only way a person could be better off is for somebody else to be worse off. Now, you know, some people say, you know, Williams, you know, all these things you rail against, um, you have to keep in mind that we are a democracy and majority rules. Well, first I try to tell people the framers did not intend for us to be a democracy. They found democracy offensive. They wanted us to be a republic. After all, when we pledge allegiance to the flag, is, is it for the democracy for which it stands? Or the song during the war between the states in 1861 was the battle hymn of the democracy? <laughs> no, republic. And, my, and, and majority rule, or majority, does not establish morality. That is just because you vote to rape somebody, that doesn't make it right. Now, some people might argue that we need a powerful government to protect us against powerful businesses. Well, that's just plain nonsense. Despite the bigness and the alleged power of industrial giants like IBM, AT&T, General Motors, what kind of power do they have over us? In order for Exxon, in order for Exxon to get a, get a dollar from me, what must occur? I must voluntarily get out of my chair, voluntarily get in my car, and voluntarily drive up this man's lot and voluntarily buy, pay him money for some gasoline. 
It's all voluntary. He has no power over me. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't say that big business can get dollars from us, whether we want to or not. But what do they have to do first? They have to go to our elected representatives to get permission to rip us off. Now take for instance the farmers. The farmers, some of the farmers are having problems. Now the farmers know where I live. I live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Now if the farmers want some help, they could go knock on my door and say, buddy, can you spare a dime? Now I'd probably tell the farmers to go play in the traffic. <laughs> and, and they know that. So they will go to their elected representative and say, if we ask Williams to voluntarily help us out, he's going to tell us to go play in the traffic. So could you use your agents down the IRS to take his money to help us out? Now, the free market and voluntary exchange are roundly denounced by the day's def defenders of the new human rights, what I call new human rights. These offenders are chief supporters of reduced private property rights, reduced rights to profits, they're anti-competition and pro-monopoly. They're pro-control and coercion by the state. These people in our country and around the world, they believe that they are intelligent and they have superior wisdom to the masses. And they believe that they have been ordained to forcibly impose that wisdom on the rest of us, whether we like it or not. Of course, they have good reasons for restricting the freedoms of others. Excuse me. But I'm here to tell you that every tyrant that has ever existed has had what the tyrant believed to be good reasons for restricting the liberty of others. Their plan requires the elimination or at least the attenuation of the market. Why do tyrants want to attack the market? Well, the market implies voluntary transactions. And tyrants do not trust that people behaving voluntarily will do what the tyrant thinks that they ought to do. So they want to replace the market with, they want to either eliminate the market or they want to replace the market with economic planning. Now I'll give you a definition of economic planning that will last you the rest of your lives. Economic planning is no more than the forcible superseding of somebody's plan, somebody else's plan, by the powerful elite. Let me give some examples of that. My daughter might plan to work for the hardware store guy down the street for $3 an hour. The hardware store guy says it's okay. She says it's okay. Her mother says it's okay. Her father says it's okay. But the powerful elite will say, we're going to supersede that plan because it's not being transacted at the prices we think it ought to be transacted, namely at the minimum wage. Or I might want to buy a Honda motorcycle from a Japanese producer. The powerful elite will say, Williams, we're going to supersede that plan through tariffs and quotas because we think you ought to buy a Harley, a Harley Davidson. Now, these people, most of them, they do it in the name of good, do all this in the name of good. Some of them just plain evil, but most <laughs> people do it in the name of good. But do-gooders don't realize that most good done in the world is not done in the name of good. And if you ask me, William, what is that human motivation that gets the most wonderful things done, I would say greed. 
I'm not talking about ripping off people, fraud and robbing, stuff like this. I'm talking about people trying to get as much as they can for themselves. Now, you might not have thought of it this way, but let me give you an example. You had Texas cattle ranchers last winter dealing with blizzards, snowstorms, getting up in the middle of the night, running down stray cows, trying to feed them, take care of them. Cows maybe even kicking them. Making this huge personal sacrifice so that New Yorkers have beef on their shelves. This summer you're going to have Idaho potato farmers getting up doing back-breaking work, sun beating down on them, dirt underneath the fingernails, bugs biting them, making this personal sacrifice so that New Yorkers will also have potatoes. Now, do you think they're doing that because they love New Yorkers? <laughs> <laughs> they may hate New Yorkers. I'm not that wild about New Yorkers myself. <laughs> So they may hate New Yorkers, but they get that beef and potatoes in New York every single day of the week. Why? Because they want more for themselves. And this is something that Adam Smith pointed out in Wealth of Nations in his book 1776, that the private good is pursued most effectively by the, the public good is pursue, pursued most effectively by the private interest. Now I ask you, how much beef and potatoes do you think New Yorkers would have if it all depended on human love and kindness? <laughs> I'd be worried about New Yorkers. <laughs> Let me give you another example of virtue of self-interest and private property rights. You know, some people say, well, instead of, you're trying to win friends and influence people. Instead of using greed, why don't you say, enlightened self-interest. <laughs> well, that's okay, but I like greed. It's more than <laughs> greed. I've often said, I don't care anything about future generations. And people say, they look in horror. They say, James, how come you don't care about future generations? Well, my answer, my response is, what have future generations ever done for me? <laughs> And if they haven't done anything for me, uh, how then am I obliged to do anything for them? Where's the quid pro quo? <laughs> but however, if you watch my actual behavior, my behavior would belie that sentiment, that statement. As I said, I live in Valley Forge, and I have very nice spread. And a number of years ago, I planted a lot of trees. I planted apple trees, <coughs> pear trees. And those trees, when they reach their full maturity, I'll be dead. There'll be some 20, 50 kid eating my apples and my pears. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Williams, uh, she made extensive improvements to our house, a beautiful sunroom. And that sunroom is going to outlast us. And there'll be some 20, 50 kid tracking mud in my nice <laughs> Now, you might ask, well, what's at least some of the reason I made the sacrifices of current consumption to produce something that's going to benefit a future generation? Well, it's very easy. The nicer my house is, the longer it will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get when I go to sell. That is, by pursuing my own selfish interests, I can't help but make a house available for a future generation, whether I mean to or not. Now ask yourself the question, would I have the same incentives if the government owned my house? Would I have the same incentive if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell my house? Namely, it would be no. <coughs> Anything that reduces my private property right interest in that house reduces my incentive to conserve on the scarce resources of our society. Um, let me just give you one more example. You people look like nice people. I don't know whether you're nice or not. <laughs> but many of you might be concerned about the extinction of various species of animals. I don't give a hoot. 
<laughs> now, it, it's a practical reason. According to scientists, according to biologists, National Biology teacher, 94% of everything that has ever lived on Earth is now extinct. Now I say, why can uh, uh, a tizzy over 94.1 or 0.2? Just let them go. <laughs> and, as a matter of fact, I think I was 35 years old when I saw my first bald eagle. I was looking at the critter in the cage. I asked myself, could I have gone another 35 years for that? <laughs> and, and I concluded yes. <laughs> but but you, uh, the point of the story, I was listening to uh, NPR some years ago, and people were, a bunch of people, young people, were picketing the UN because they were concerned about the extinction of elephants, the, uh, the great gorilla, and other animals. And I wrote down this list of animals that they're in a tizzy over, picketing and everything. Then I wrote down another group of animals that are very valuable to us, but nobody's in a tizzy over them. I said, how come people are not marching for the pig? <laughs> or, 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 or forming a, a Save the Chicken Clubs. <laughs> Well, what's the difference between these two lists of animals? That is cows, pigs, sheep, and chickens, and the other list of giraffes, the great gorillas, and tigers. Well, this list of animals, cows, pigs, and chickens, they belong to somebody. Somebody's private, personal wealth is at stake. So it pays to take care of them. With this list of animals, Nobody's personal private wealth is at stake. How are you made any worse off if, if whales die, become extinct? You're not made any worse off. You might be a little sad not looking at the critter. But so, by the way, and those of you who are concerned about the extinction of various species, you have to try to privatize them. <laughs> now, Despite the virtues of the free market, never mind the fact that capitalism brought, brought better treatment to women, racial minorities, the handicapped, criminals, and the insane, there's considerable hostility towards free markets. And social reformers say that it doesn't work. Maybe it doesn't work because it's not allowed to work. And evidence that, that uh, capitalism pr produces a more humane society comes when you consider that before the rise of capitalism, the road to great wealth came through looting, plundering, and enslaving your fellow man. With the rise of capitalism, the road to great wealth was by pleasing your fellow man finding what your fellow man wanted but did not have and produce it. Bill Gates is very rich because he found a way to please his fellow man through his products. By the way, you know, I was giving this lecture oh, some years ago and uh, uh, one lady in the audience, audience stood, arise, stood up and said, capitalism is oppressive to women. So I asked her, I said, well, what country would you like to live in? Saudi Arabia, China, Russia. No, you want to live in the United States, even if you're, if you're a radical feminist. Or if you're a criminal, where do you want to go to jail? You want to go to jail in Pakistan, Mexico, no, you want to go to jail in the United States so you don't miss your HBO shows in there. <laughs> now, let me begin to close because I'm sure there's some questions. Almost every group in our nation has come to feel 
that the government owes them a special privilege or favor. Conservatives are by no means exempt from this process, from this practice. Manufacturers feel that government owes them protective tariffs, that is, keep foreign goods out so that domestic producers can charge higher prices. Farmers feel that government owes them crop subsidies, that is, take the money from one American and give it to them for the crop subsidies. Organized labor feels that government should keep their jobs protected from competition with those who are not union members. Coastal areas feel that government should give them funds for rivers and harbors. Intellectuals, college professors, feel that government should give them funds to do research. College professors love to get three and four and five hundred thousand dollar grants to do studies on poverty and meet at a very nice hotel in Florida during the winter to talk about poor people. <laughs> <laughs> conservatives, if you ever seen our conservatives arguing, just talk about food stamps. Conservatives argue against food stamps, but they come out and support for aid to dependent farmers, aid to dependent banks, and aid to dependent motorcycle companies. Conservatives as well as liberals, Republicans as well as Democrats, prove H.L. Mencken's definition of election quite correct. H.L. Mencken was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. He's now dead. But Somebody asked H.L. Mencken to give the definition of an election. And H.L. Mencken replied, government is a broker in pillage. And every election is an advance auction on the sale of stolen goods. <laughs> now, to the extent that H.L. Mencken is correct, we've identified our problem. Too many of us are <coughs> politicians for our problem. And they're, 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 they're part of the way, just a little tiny part. But, ladies and gentlemen, we are the blame. You and I are the blame. Because politicians are doing precisely what we elect them to office to do. What do we elect them to office to do? We elect them to office for them to use the power of their office to take the property of one American and bring it back to us. You say, well, Professor Williams, well, we don't do that in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine I'm running for the United States Senate from Florida. And I go around the state and I tell the citizens of Florida, I say, look, my fellow Floridians, I've read the United States Constitution. And if you elect me to the United States Senate, don't expect for me to bring back billions of dollars in aid to higher education. Don't expect for me to bring back billions of dollars for the Corps of Engineers. Don't expect for me to uh, promote subsidies for uh, sugar plantations. Do you think I would get elected to the Senate from Florida? No, I wouldn't. And the reason why is that I would not be doing what Floridians want me to do. And Floridians would be right, not electing me to office. Why? Because if I don't bring back billions of dollars to Floridians, it doesn't mean that you're going to pay a lower federal income tax. All that it means is that Alabama will get it instead. <laughs> That is, once legalized theft begins, it pays for all of us to participate. And those who do not participate in this legalized theft will wound up, will wind up holding the brown end of the stick. And if you have a rural background, you know about the brown end of the stick. <laughs> now, let me close by saying 
that I think that we have at the root of our problem is a serious moral problem that we have. And, and that moral problem is that we support and demand that the Congress of the United States forcibly use one American to serve the purposes of another American. That's a deep moral problem. Now, you should not misunderstand me. I believe in helping our fellow man in need. I believe that helping our fellow man in need by reaching into our own pockets to do so is praiseworthy and laudable. Helping our fellow man in need by reaching into somebody else's pockets to do so, I think is worthy of condemnation. And for the Christians among us, when God gave Moses the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal, I'm sure he did not mean thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in the United States Congress. <laughs> now, let me close by saying that if the founders were to come back to the United States, they'd be very disappointed of what you and I have allowed to happen. But the hopeful note is that we Americans, we have never done the wrong thing for a long time. That is, we always manage to get our house in order. We've always, we've always managed in the past to write wrong things. But we better be getting about the job of writing the wrong thing, the massive growth of government, while we still have the liberty to do so. Thank you very much. And about fair taxation, yet we have folks that don't pay any tax and some folks that get money back. What is your definition of a fair uh, amount of taxation? You know, pay a fair price. Well, um, if, you, if you look at it, the federal government spends about 25% of the GDP. And historically, as I said, we've only spent 3% of the GDP from 1787 to about 1920, 1925, except in wartime. And um, I believe that, that everyone is obligated to have some skin in the game. And, and, and what, what Congress has done is rather truly amazing, is that close to 50% of the people in our nation have no federal income tax liability. That's very dangerous. And the reason why is that these people become natural constituents for big spending politicians. That is, if you're not paying into federal taxes, what do you care about what federal spending have, what happened to the federal spending? Um, and matter of fact, you see some evidence of it during the so-called Bush administration tax cuts, they weren't very popular. And why would you be happy about a tax cut if you're not paying any taxes? And a tax cut would, would uh, be, for you, it would be a threat to the handout programs that you have. Now, I think that the way the founders envisioned the uh, um, taxation in our country was not through an income tax. The founders abhorred an income tax or a direct tax, a tax on people. And throughout most of our history, the federal government was run through uh, tariffs and excise taxes, not taxes on individuals. 
Uh, and maybe it's unrealistic to expect it, but I would like to go back in that direction. Um, so, so, but however, our major focus should not be on taxes. It should be on federal spending. Because the, it's, it's a long explanation, but I've written columns about it and you can just Google it. But, but the, um, the true measure of government activity is, federal, is, is government spending, not government taxes. Because in, in one sense, the government does not have to tax at all. You just inflate the currency, just print money. And that'd be disastrous, of course. But the question is that we have to pay attention to is, is federal spending as opposed to federal taxing. That's the major problem. Okay. Who's up next? There we go, in the back. And by the way, if you're reluctant to ask a question, just say, you know, I have a liberal friend, and he said, if I ever see you, ask this question. Several years ago, uh, a group got together in Lakeland and built a, a monument of sculpture to the spirit of the volunteer in this community. I would wonder what you would have to say about young, to young people about the uh, concept of volunteering. Well, I think, uh, fortunately, voluntary, vol volu voluntary action is still a very, very strong part of our country, of, our, of the spirit of America. As a matter of fact, uh, the generosity of Americans has been noted for a long time. When Alexis de Tocqueville, when he visited the country in, 18, in 1830s, ostensibly do a study on prisons, which he did not do. Uh, he did a study of the American people who went all around the country. And when he got back to France, he was giving lectures. He said, those Americans, they just love a committee. Somebody's house burns down, barn burns down, they have a committee. Somebody becomes a widow, they have a committee. <clears throat> that is, there's been, generosity is part of the American spirit. And, and, if you, and you see this, if you ask, if you ask yourself the question, how did, you know, what happened to senior citizens? Where did they die? Well, most senior citizens died in the homes of their children. Now, very often, they die in little lonely, in little green rooms. Um, if you look at the devastating effects of the welfare state to help people out, it's been devastating. That is, it's changed incentives. And, and, for, and particularly, most devastatingly, for black Americans. That is, the welfare state has done to black Americans what slavery could not have done, what harshest discrimination and Jim Crow could not have done, namely destroyed the black family. And, 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 and white families are not that far behind now. That is, the, the illegitimacy rate among blacks in 1940 was 11%. Today is 75%. The illegitimacy rate among whites in 1940 was 3%. Today is slightly over 30%. And if you go, if you go to Sweden, the illegitimacy, the illegitimacy rate is around 50%. So, um, so helping people uh, privately is far more effective than helping people um, uh, through government. And, and matter of fact, if you ask yourself a question, the parents among you, suppose you had a daughter, 16, year old, 16 years old, 17 years old, and she makes a mistake and becomes pregnant. How many of us would say, well, here's $500, come back next month, get another $500, watch TV, watch Oprah, get another $500. And if you have another kid, you get $700. We wouldn't do that to anybody we love, but we do that to poor people. We make, we make slumly behavior profitable. And, and any economist, whether he's liberal or conservative, he'll tell you that if you tax something, 
you're going to get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it. And what we've been doing as a nation, we've been subsidizing sloppy behavior. And, and people uh, demand that we continue uh, subsidizing slovenly behavior. All of our questions. Okay. Uh, wait, let's, she's going to jump in here. Okay, so Sav's going to ask a question. While you argue it's not economic to use tax dollars to help the poor, homeless, etc., what would be your economic argument for or against funding education versus roads? Well, my, my daughter's education is my responsibility. It's not your responsibility. It's not anybody else's responsibility. And so-called public schools are relatively new in our history. That is, uh, we, all 50 states uh, had public schools, uh, like 48 or earlier, by 1930. But before, we didn't have public schools. And, uh, and there, there were... Uh, there, there was the one-room school, the school mom. Um, and then with uh, increases in public education um, and increases in the resources spent on public education, we can't be very proud about the results of it. Um, close to 50% of incoming freshmen at colleges, they require remedial math, remedial English, or remedial writing. So what does that say? That suggests that the high school diploma is fraudulent. That is a high school diploma, a test that you read and write, that you're able to read and write at the 12th grade level. And many times, uh, youngsters get their uh, high school diploma and they can't read and write at the eighth grade level. Um, or, or do math at the eighth grade level. Um, I think college education, I think it's been overstated. That is, not everybody needs to go to college, but that's the message that's being uh, put out. Um, and, you know, there's a, and, and then also, um, many students, when they graduate from high school, are too immature for college. I know for myself, I look back in 1954 when I graduated from high school, if I had gone to college right out of high school, it would have been an unmitigated disaster. I was ready. I was too immature. And when I started college, I was, it was after I was in the Army. When I got out of the Army, I was 24 and I was married. And I went to college 10 consecutive years, including the summers. I had blinders on. I mean, I had, uh, you know. But many, many times I, I go across George Mason Uni University campus, and I go to the library. And the kids, you know, like 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock, and the kids out there playing Frisbee. And I get out there at 11 o'clock, and they're still up there playing Frisbee. It was a waste of time. Now, and so, in terms of going to college, what I would recommend to a lot of parents is when your kid graduates from high school, get them a job at a car wash or at McDonald's or something like that. Let them gain some maturity, and then having gained some maturity, he might be ready for college. But, but in sum, in answering your question, I don't think that it's your responsibility to educate my child. And I don't think it's my responsibility to educate yours. Okay, so we'll go down here. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Williams, as you pointed out, the loss of liberty typically is incremental, a little bit at a time. So in order to reverse, and you stated your hopefulness was that we would right the ship in time. So. In order for that to happen, a lot of folks have to hear the message that you provided today. You've got to kind of get the word out. Well, we're not probably not going to get the word out by speaking individually to folks. So you tend to rely on the media to do that. At least that's one of the, the, the vehicles for having that happen. Give me your assessment of the culpability of the media in promulgating the loss of liberty in this country. 
Well, I think, I think that the, uh, the media and, and education in general, uh, one of their big faults is not requiring people to back up um, ideas with facts. That is, uh, people you hear now very popular among the millennials and their, uh, uh, therefore, socialism. Um, they're, they're supporters of Bernie Sanders, who is an avowed uh, socialist. Now, if, if, if educators and media people were doing their job, they would ask the people, ask Sanders and ask others, well, could you point to some successes of socialism? That'd be very hard to do. Now, a lot of people will say they'll point to escape Scandinavian countries. And the Scandinavian countries, such as Sweden, they experimented with socialism for about two decades, and they gave up on it. As a matter of fact, today's socialists would have nothing to do with the policies of Sweden. For example, Sweden has no minimum wage law. Sweden has school vouchers promote private education. Sweden has engaged in a lot of deregulation. The prime minister a couple of years ago of Denmark uh, said, and matter of fact, I'm quoting him in my next week's column for those of you who read it in Lakeland, that, uh, that it's wrong to call uh, Denmark and Nordic countries uh, Swedish. He protests again, not uh, socialists. He protests against that. I think that if you go to do some side-by-side -side comparisons, take after World War II, uh, we split Germany into two countries, East Germany, well actually several, but generally West Germany and East Germany. It turns out that, that uh, West Germany was much richer than socialist uh, East Germany. Or look at North Korea and South Korea. The per capita income in North Korea what is about 3% of the per capita income of people in South, South Korea. Or if you just look at a satellite map of the world at night, and you look at the countries that are well lit and the countries that are dark, they tend to be the socialist countries. And so he, I think the big problem is, is that, uh, one of the big problems is that people are not, people's ideas are not challenged enough. We don't look at facts to challenge the ideas of, of uh, people advocating for socialism. A matter of fact, uh, last year we celebrated, uh, we shouldn't be celebrating, we shouldn't call it celebrating, but it was the 45th anniversary of Jonestown in, in Guyana. And, and, uh, and Jones was a socialist and he tried to have socialism in Guyana and it turned out to be a disaster. In general, what socialism tries to do, it tries to change human nature by force. It tries to force people into doing what they don't want to do. And then finally, socialism has a record for the most murders in world history. That is, <coughs> the, <coughs> the Soviet Union is estimated to have murdered 45 million of his own citizens. Mao Zedong, uh, uh, roughly the same number. Then you find Hitler, who was socialist, the National Socialist Workers Party, that's what Nazis stood for, uh, murdering people. And you cannot find, I don't, I don't think I would like to know, if anybody can give me an answer, I don't find capitalist countries that murder millions of their own citizens. And if you want an update, or actual detail on this, there's a book written by a former colleague of mine, Hummel, at the Professor Hummel at the University of Hawaii, and it's called Death by Government. 
and he has it on the, uh, it's on the internet, readily accessible, death by government, and it lists all the countries and the murders. And he points out that the, the 20th century was mankind's most brutal century. Well over 100 million people were slaughtered by their own governments. And then roughly 60 million lost their lives in war. So socialism just does not have a very good record. Okay.